Hello and welcome to our last session uh, on the web and mobile track. Please welcome Okan, uh, is a manager AI and big data at Mills, Miles, uh, is a Microsoft MVP and MCT, and he also the co-founder of AI42. Uh, I have to ask, whenever I see 42, it always reminds me of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Is that related? Yeah, actually, so what we say is that it's AI42 because, you know, 42 is the answer to all your questions. Exactly. So uh, it's uh, AI42 is an online school uh, for AI and data science. And you also co-founder of Azure Meetup Group, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. You have uh, 20 years of experience. You've been developer, tester, architect, leader, scrum master. Uh, any role you're really passionate about or you have to try everything for a while? Yeah, I think it's nice to to try out a little bit of everything. It gives you know new new insights, new perspectives. Exactly. So um, thank you very much, and everyone enjoy the session. Feel free to ask question in the Q and A, and uh, enjoy the session. See you soon. Thank you so much. So uh, um, so first of all, thank you so much for attending my session here. So. We're going to spend the next 40 minutes talking about how you can run machine learning in the browser using a JavaScript framework called TensorFlow.js. Uh, but before we uh, but before we start, I just have some information here, uh, more about me. Um, so uh, yeah, so my uh, I'm working as a manager for AI and big data at the Norwegian consultancy company called Miles. And I have background in process automation and robotics. And you can also find you know, my, uh, my social media handles on this slide. So the topic here is machine learning in the browser using TensorFlow.js. But just to get all of us on the same page, we're going to be starting with some background information on machine learning. And then after that, we're going to talk about TensorFlow, what TensorFlow is, and then we will focus on TensorFlow.js. And then we're going to run two different demos here. So in our first demo, we're going to be starting from scratch. And then we're going to load, load some data and do some data analysis in the browser. And then we're going to build and, uh, and train um, a machine learning model also in the browser. And then we will feed it with some new data and see how it performs all, and all of this in the browser. And then after that, what we're going to do in our second demo is we're going to build an image classifier using an already pre-trained machine learning model. And um, yeah, we're going to be converting this machine learning model so that we can use it in TensorFlow in running in the browser. But first of all, what is machine learning? So maybe, uh, maybe some of you think that machine learning and AI must be quite new since they're a quite hot topic today. Um, but as a matter of fact, machine learning dates back already to the 1950s. So there was a researcher called Arthur Samuel. He said that machine learning is a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And you can also say that machine learning is sort of a pattern recognition in historical data. And some of the applications of machine learning can, for example, be prediction, uh, so a classical example within prediction is that you have um, you have a house um, that you uh, want to uh, want to sell, and then you want to be able to predict what kind of price could I sell this house for, and then you have to define some different features, like it could be the location of the house, how big the house is, when was it built, what is the area, and so on. And then based on that, you can use machine learning in order to predict what was, what will this house be sold for. Another application is a recommendation system. So probably many of you has bought something online and then you have seen, maybe you will be recommended uh, different other products that people that are similar to you has bought. So that's also um, an application here or machine learning. And um, also uh, you can use clustering. So say that you have a web shop with a large amount of customers, then you can use clustering to see similar similarities between different groups of customers so that you can tailor made the different um, options to these uh, customers. 
And as you can see here on, on this slide, we can also use image recognition and you can use it for text recognition or speech recognition. So one of the way that we can run machine learning is called supervised learning. So the way that supervised, supervised learning works is that you have access to historical input data and also historical output data. And then based on, uh, based on that, you can build a machine learning model and you can train it. And then after that, you can feed it with new real-time data that it hasn't seen before. And based on that real-time data, this machine learning model can give us either a recommendation or a prediction. So as I said here in the beginning, I said that machine learning dates back all, uh, all the way back to the 1950s, uh, but it's a very hot topic today. And you might ask yourself why. And the reason for that is that we have a number of different enabling technologies. So one of them is IoT, that we have access to sensors that can give us access to a lot of real-time data. And we also have big data solutions so that we can do transformations and load and transformation in, in the cloud. And we also have machine learning, uh, uh, machine learning libraries and components that we, we as developers can use through different API and services. I would also like to mention a little bit here about what kind of languages you can use for machine learning. So actually you can use any language that you, that you want. But the thing is that you don't really want to start out from scratch. You want to use um, you want to use a language where you already have existing libraries that you can use so that you don't need to start from zero. So two of the most common um, languages uh, to use for machine learning is Python and R. And the difference here is that Python historically has been more most uh, common among people with a computer science background, whereas R has been more commonly used with people coming from a more of a statistical background or coming from university. So now that we know a little bit more about what machine learning is, we can go more into TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is an open source library that was developed by the Google Brain te team. And the thing with TensorFlow is that it uses something called tensor operations. And um, one advantage with using TensorFlow is that it supports distributed computing. So that makes it a really good candidate if you want to do deep learning or neural networks. But what is actually a tensor? So a tensor is a concept that is taken from mathematics and physics. So um, we can uh, see here in mathematics, we can distinguish between a scalar, which is just a single real time number. We can also talk about vectors, which is like a one dimensional collection of uh, numbers. Or we can talk about the matrix, which you can say is like a two dimensional vector, a uh, two dimensional container here for numbers. And then a tensor is just a container that can either contain a scalar, a vector, or a matrix. And the thing that is special with TensorFlow is that it only works with tensor as its sort of data format. So if you want to use, you know, pure TensorFlow, which is a Python library, then what you can do is you can start up in Python, you can start up, uh, you can import TensorFlow and you can start up a new session. And then you define some numbers like A and B here. And then you can do a mathematical operation like here, for example, we are adding A plus B and we just print it out on the console. But now what is the TensorFlow.js? So TensorFlow.js is a JavaScript library so that you can both train and you can deploy your models in the browser and on Node.js. So now we've uh, come to my first, our first uh, demonstration here. So let me switch over here to my, uh, uh, let me switch over to my browser. See here. So actually, uh, let me switch over here to uh, Visual Studio Code. So in Visual Studio Code right now, we have an index.html file where we are importing the TensorFlow.js JavaScript library. And we also have a main JavaScript file here called script.js. And right now in our script.js file, the only thing that we do is we just write out console log and we say hello TensorFlow. So if we uh, go back to our browser and go back here, run this, then we can see that it just wrote out 
hello TensorFlow in the console log. So that could, that's uh, good. That's um, a starting point here. Uh, but the thing is that now we need to find some data and we need to define a problem. And then we will ne need to see, can machine learning help us solve that kind of problem? So luckily for us, we actually here have a JSON file here with some car data, with some information about different cars. So if we look through this um, the JSON file, we can see that it's the name of the car, the type of the car, uh, the horsepower and the miles per, per gallon, for example. So one thing that could be useful for us to know here is can we somehow predict the uh, miles per, per gallon depending on the horsepower of a car? So in order to find that out, the, thing, the first thing that we need to do is we need to be able to load this data into our JavaScript application. So if we go back to Visual Studio Code, uh, then we can add a function here for loading this um, JSON file here. So we have a function, get data, and we fetch this uh, JSON file. And then after that, we do some mapping here so that we get the miles per gallon. We call that MPG, and we call horsepower for uh, horsepower. And then we do some filtering here because we don't want to have the null values. So we remove the null values from our data, and then we return our clean data. And then the second thing that we want to do is we want to be able to run this function somehow. So let's let us define a run function. So over here we have defined the run function. So we get our data. Uh, so we read our data from the JSON file. And then after that, we map it so that we get on the X values is the horsepower and on the Y on the y values is the miles per gallon. And then after that, we can render a scatter plot because what we want to find out is we want to see is there any sort of correlation here between the miles per gallon and the horsepower? Because if there is no correlation at all, then machine learning will not help us in any way. But if there is, um, if there is a, a correlation between miles per gallon and horsepower, then that's a good candidate for a machine learning problem. So we want to render here a scatterplot so we can use of an already built-in function in the TensorFlow uh, visualization JavaScript library. So we just call uh, tfvis render and then the scatterplot. And then on the x uh, axis, we will have the horsepower and on the y axis, we have the miles per gallon. And then we will add more code to this example as we go along. And then we can add an event listener that listens to the DOM content loaded. And when that is loaded, then we will run our function. So we save this, and then we go back to our browser, uh, which is here, and then we load this. Uh, so here we can see that without us having to actually program almost anything, we just made use of already built-in function in this TensorFlow visualization component. Then we got a nice graph here, a scatter plot, where we have uh, we have the miles per gallon on the y-axis and the horsepower on the x-axis. And we can actually see that there seems to be some sort of relation or correlation between miles per gallon and horsepower. And that's a good thing because that means that we can try and use machine learning in order to see, can we actually predict a miles per gallon value uh, out from a horsepower, val uh, horsepower value here. Uh, so our goal here is that we want to train a machine learning model where the input is the horsepower and then the prediction is the miles per gallon. And we will use these values that we already have, this, um, uh, this JSON that data, and we will feed these uh, values into a neural network. And then this neural network will learn from this example data. So after that, when we have, uh, when we have learned, then it can predict a miles per gallon from horsepower. And this is an example of this supervised learning that we were looking at in the presentation here. So the first thing that we want to do now is we want to do something that is called define our model architecture. So basically in machine learning terms, that means that we want to decide what kind of algorithms should this model use in order to compute this answer. So in machine learning models, they are just an algorithm that will take an input and then it will produce an output. And in this case, we'll use a neural network. So here, the algorithm will be a layer of neurons with different weights, and these weights will decide what the output will be from this neural network. 
So when we train our neural network, then this algorithm will learn the best values for these weights. The first thing that we want to do is we want to create our machine learning model. Uh, so let's go back to our, uh, our Research Studio code, and then we can define a new function. So we define a new function here called create model. So here we're making use of inbuilt functionality in the TensorFlow JS library. So the first thing that we do is we define our model. So we define it as a sequential model, TF sequential. And this is one of the most simple model that we have in the TensorFlow.js library. It's called sequential because the input flows straight down to its output. But of course, there are much more complex models. You can have multiple input, you can have multiple output, and you can also have different branches in your model too. And then after that, we call model add, and this will add an input layer to our model. And this uh, layer is connected to something that we call a dense layer. So a dense layer is a type of layer that will multiply the input with a matrix that was these weights, and then it will add a number that we call bias to the result. And since this is the first layer of the network, we also need to specify the input shape, which is one. That, that means that we have one number as an input, and that, that number is the horsepower of the car. And uh, we also set units. So units sets how big will this weight matrix be in this layer. And here we set it to one, so that means that there will be one weight for each of the input features of this data. And then we create our output layer, where we set also set the units one because we want to have one number as an output, and that is the miles per gallon. And then for us, in order to use this model that we've just defined, we just need to create an instance here of our model. So we, let's do that here in our run function. Here we're just calling um, uh, create model uh, to create our uh, machine learning model. And then after, after that, again, we're using some predefined functionality called show model summary. So let us see, let us save this and then we can run it and we can see what will happen. We run this again, uh, we get our graph here, and then below, that, below this graph, we get um, a model summary. So this is very common for data science and machine learning engineers who are using Python and Jupyter Notebooks, for example. So what this model summary tells us is tells us the different layers that we have in a model. It also tells us the shape of the layer, the number of parameters, and also if they are trainable or not. So that's some valuable information here for us. So now when we've defined the model here, then what we uh, want to do is we would like to prepare our data for training. So let's uh, uh, define here a function um, in, our, uh, in our Visual Studio code. And remember I was saying here that TensorFlow only works with tensors as uh, as the data format. So that means that we somehow need to convert our JSON data into the tensor, tensor format. So here we define the function, which is called convert to tensor of this data. Um, so, the, um, so some of the things that we do here, we are doing two best practice here when we're handling data. So the first best practice is to shuffle the data. And the reason why we want to shuffle our data is because when we train our machine learning model, we will divide our data into smaller subsets that we call batches. So when we train our machine learning model, we want these batches to be as representative as possible for the whole data set. And that's why we would like to have data from all across the data distribution. And this comes with some advantages because uh, if we shuffle our data, then we don't run into the risk that we will only learn things that are dependent on the order of an input data. Because remember, remember now we're just shuffling the data so that we get some random, random data from all over this data distribution. And we will also not be so sensitive to structures in subgroups. You could imagine that maybe there's a high horsepower for one reason or the other, there is a high horsepower for the first half of the training data, but now, and that would be a relationship that would not be representative for the whole data set. But now we don't need to worry about it because we are shuffling our data here. And then after that, we convert our data to uh, tensors, use, also using a pre-built uh, function, T of tensor 2D. And then we get our input tensor. 
and uh, which is the horsepower, and then we get our label tensor, which is the output, the miles per gallon. Then after that, we do another best practice, which is to just to normalize our data. So the reason why we want to normalize our data. So when we normalize our data, we get all our data will be in the range between zero and one using something called mean max scaling. And the reason why we want to do this is because many of the internal functions of machine learning models, they are designed to work with small numbers. So if we um, do normalization, then we are sure that we will not run into any problems later on. Um, and then um, we are also um, storing the input max, uh, the input min and the label max and the label min. Because the thing is that when we're finished, when we have trained a machine learning model and we have gotten a result back, then we will, then we need to be able to scale it back to the original scale. So that's why we want to save these different min and max bounds. So, uh, yeah. So after that, the things that we want to do now is we want to actually train our data. We can define function here. Uh, we are training our model here. So the first thing that we want to do is we need to compile our machine learning model before we can train it. And we also need to set some parameters for this compilation. So one of the parameters is what kind of optimizer do we want to have? And an optimizer is an algorithm that will decide on the updates to the model when it sees new example here. And there are many different types of optimizers in TensorFlow JS. And here we just picked the Adam optimizer because it's quite effective and it requires very little configuration. And then we also need to define a loss function. So a loss function is like a quality function that will tell us how well is our model performing? How well is it learning when it sees a new uh, batch, a new data subset? And here we will use a st also a standard function here called mean squared error. So the mean squared error will, will compare the predictions made by the model with the true values. And then next we are selecting a batch size. So batch size is just how big will this data subsets be? And there is no, um, uh, there is no uh, uh, strict rules here. So you have common batch sizes can be in the range from 32 to 512. And it's actually a little bit of science in itself to find out the right batch size, but here we just pick 32. And then we also need to define the number of epochs. The number of epochs is how many times will our model look at the entire data set. And here we will take 50 iterations through the data set. And then finally, we are starting the training loop here. So we call model.fit with our input and our lab labels. And uh, we can also define some more, um, uh, some more parameters for our model.fit. So for example, we can define a callback. So in the callback, we'll use this TensorFlow visualization component in order to show us the loss and the mean squared error. So then we can get some idea on how well is our uh, training do, doing. So we can do some monitoring of our training here. So then it's actually time for us to do some training here of the data. So we need to add some functions here to our run, uh, run um, function over here. And save. So what we do here is first we uh, convert our data to tensors and we split out the labels and the inputs. And then after that, we call, we train our model using the train model. And then we can also monitor our training. And then we write out on the console log done training when we're finished. We go back uh, to the browser here and we run this. And we can see here, uh, so for each, for each epoch here, we can see how well our training goes. So this is the loss function and this is the mean squared error. And we want that these to be as low as possible. So we can here see here that it's 0 0.07, for example. So let's say that we are, let's say that we are, mm, uh, we are happy with that kind of mean squared error. So then what we want to do then is then we would actually like to try out our machine learning model. So we want to feed it with new data and see how well can our machine learning model predict, um, predict miles per gallon. Uh, depending on this, uh, uh, on the input data that, that it gets. So we want to be able to test our model. 
So let us uh, let us define a function for testing. It's so here in uh, in our test um, function, we are generating one hundred new examples for our uh, our data here, and we will feed this into our model, and then uh, we will get back a, a prediction here. So that's why we call it model dot predict with these input numbers, and then we will uh, get some miles per gallon as an output. And then, as, as I said, we need to do some conversions so that we can get it back into the same scale as the original data. So that's when we use this input max, input mean, and label max and label mean. And then finally, what we do here is we uh, we render a new scatter plot where we can uh, plot the model predictions versus the original data so we can see how well are we actually performing. So now the only thing that we uh, that remains here is we need to run this model here. So let's go to the run function. Here we just call test model on our data. And then we can go over to browser. And just for clarity here, you know, Right now we're training every time we run our function, but that's just because this is like a, like a demonstration example. So we wouldn't do this in a real, uh, real time, real world um, example here. You don't need to train your machine learning algorithm every, every time you need you want to use it. Um, but anyways, so here we get here. So here we can see this is the original data. And then our machine learning model predicts that this should be the miles per gallon. Uh, whereas we can see that this blue thing here, that's the, you know, that's the real data that we should expect. So we can see here that there is something in which looks quite, quite odd here because, um, because the real data has like a curvature here, and then we are using like a straight line function here in order to try to predict it. So maybe, uh, maybe there is something that we can do about this. So let us change a little bit here on our machine learning model. Let's, um, let's find here where we define our machine learning model, which is which is over here. And then we can commit this thing out. So um, so what we do here instead here is still we, again we're using this sequential model. But we we're adding some more layers. So without getting to, into much into too much complication, the more layers that you add to a neural network, the more complicated sort of behavior it can predict. So we could see here that this data had like a curve linear um, a shape. So if we add some more layers, then our machine learning model would be able to better predict it. So it will not use a straight line. It will try to use some sort of a curvature in order to in order to, to do their predictions. So let us just run this again here in the browser. We can see here uh, from the model summary, we can see that we've added some more layers. We also see that the number of parameters that are trainable are much higher than before here. So in the third layer, for example, we have 4,000 trainable parameters. And we can also see here that you know before we had 0 0.07 here at a loss function, and now we have 0 0.01, which is a much better value than before. And then finally, we can also see from our graph here that yeah, now we have actually our machine learning model is able to take this curve linear aspects into account here, so it produces like a slope here for our uh, our predictions. So that sort of concludes our. Uh, First uh, demo here. So what I would like you to, uh, what I would like you to take away uh, from this, is that um, is that you know uh, without us having to write too much code, we could both do training, we could read uh, our data and do some data analysis in the browser. We could train a new machine learning algorithm, and we could also test it all in all in the browser. 
and you making use of pre-built functionality in the TensorFlow.js library. And let me just quickly check here if there are any questions. Yes, so we have a couple of questions here. Uh, so the first question here uh, is about what about outliers in data? Do we need to clean up data from outliers before building a model using uh, TensorFlow? Yeah, so that's um, that's also uh, like a, a common best practice here to try to make your data, the data that you're using, try to make it as representative as possible. So usually an outlier is not representative for the whole data set. So then you would like to, uh, then you would like to get rid of that. And then we have also a second question. Uh, is it possible to enable the GPU or the TPU power if necessary by TensorFlow JS as well? Actually, I'm not, I'm not sure about that because you know all of this is running in the browser. So I guess that it depends on if you can enable the GPU or TPU in, in the browser area. So I'm not, I have to look that up actually and see if we can do that or not. And then uh, the last question for now is, it's, uh, is it possible to apply TensorFlow on time series? Yes, so you can also use TensorFlow as time series. So in um, basically almost all you can do in the regular TensorFlow, you can also do in the TensorFlow JS. Let me go back here to my presentation and keep the questions coming here. So, uh, so our next example here is that we would like to import an existing model and we will want to make use of that in TensorFlow JS. So what we can do is we can convert an existing model uh, from Keras, which comes in an H5 format to the TensorFlow JS layers format. So we can use a special tool here uh, on the command prompt where we can call the TensorFlow JS converter and we can just, um, that we need to define where is our model um, lying and then where do we want to have our output. So if we do this in Python, you can see an example here that we're loading the mobile net from Keras, the mobile net model, and then after that we use this TensorFlow.js converter and we save our Keras models as a TensorFlow.js model. And then in our JavaScript application, we can import it and we can load it by using TensorFlow load layers models and then point it to where our converted model is. And we're gonna have a look at this in a just short while here. But you might ask yourself, why would we want to use TensorFlow.js in the first place? Why do we want to run this in the browser? So one of the reasons is that, you know, you don't need to learn another language, you don't need to learn Python, you don't need to learn R or Conda or Jupyter Notebooks. So this opens up machine learning for a whole new uh, set of developers. So everyone who, you know, who is a web developer or anyone who can uh, write, uh, run some, JavaScript can actually do machine learning now. And that's, uh, that's very, very interesting. And in addition, you don't need to run, uh, do any round trip between the client and the server. So, uh, so this, everything is taking place on the client. And uh, that goes also into the next point that you can say that the user data is local so that it's more secure than before. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, the browser application, yeah, you also have access to the browser as your user interface and then everyone knows how a browser is working so they don't need to use any specialized uh, user inter interface. And this is uh, the way that it works is so either you can develop machine learning with JavaScript as we did in our first place or we can run an existing model or we can also retrain an existing model. So let's say that maybe you have a model that can detect cars but you want to specialize your model into detecting uh, detecting uh, Tesla cars, for example, then you can then you can do that. And here is just an overview of the different types of models that are already existing here. So then we've come to the next uh, uh, demo here, uh, which is an image classifier. Uh, so let me just uh, just open up a file here. Uh, one moment here. <clears throat> yes, so or I can actually let me run the uh, let me run the 
um, let me run the demo so that you can see what it looks like. So over here, we have an application here. Let me reload this, where you can select, select, select the file, an image, so let's select this file. And then we select a machine learning model. So in this case, we select the mobile net model. And then after that, we can push the predict button. And then we can get the prediction here that our machine learning model predicts that this is a strawberry with 99.9%. So then we're going to have a look at how this is done. So, so if we have a look here, so this is the our HTML file where we have we're loading a model. We can select different types of machine learning models and so on. But the important thing here is that here we're importing the TensorFlow JS uh, library. And uh, we are also importing something called predict.js where we're doing our machine learning stuff. And then we're also importing something called ImageNet classes that we also will have a look at. But if we look here in our predict file, so here we can see that we, when we use our image selector, then we are reading the image uh, into a file reader. And when we uh, change our machine learning model, then we're calling this load model function, which we, which we have down here. So here we are actually using this load layers model. So what we've done before we did all of this, we used this uh, command tool in order to convert uh, uh, the mobile net Keras H5 model into TensorFlow.js model. So here what it tries to do is that it tries to load a model here where we can see here that it tries to lo load a model where we have this name comes as an input parameter. So then we have a directory structure. So it uh, goes into um, goes into this. Uh, uh, let me see here. Uh, into this TFJS models. And then it will go into this mobile net. And then over here you have, this is the result of our conversion. So have our model.json file and then some other binary files that it makes use of. And then after that, when we click on the predict button, it does some conversion because remember TensorFlow is only working with tensors. So it needs to do some pre-processing of our image. And then it we can call model.predict and then we will get back some data. And then we just do some sorting here in order to get the five most probable uh, predictions. And then we're using, so from this machine learning model, we will just get a probability and also an index, like just the numbers. Then we need to, we need to do a lockup in a table here called ImageNet classes in order to get a, a textual representation here. So if we go to ImageNet classes, you can see that, for example, if we get five back, then it would have been an electric ray or a crampfish or, or whatever. So basically that is, and we can also see here that we didn't need to write that much code. We could make use of the already existing functionality in this, uh, in this library here. So let me uh, try to find uh, my way back here to the presentation, which is here. So now in the last part of my presentation, I'm gonna talk about some real world, some real world examples here. So we have one real ex world example from Uber. So uh, they have a tool called Uber Manifold where they are using, it's a visual debugging tool that is using TensorFlow.js. And you can find more information about Uber if you follow this GitHub link. And we also have an example from Airbnb. So when you want to sublet an apartment or a property or Airbnb, there's always a risk that maybe you, ha you have some, um, some private documentation available like your passport or driver's license on these images. So what, what Airbnb has done is that when a user is trying to upload a profile picture to the Airbnb website, then they will run the machine learning model on the client that will warn you that you're choosing a picture that where there may be some sensitive information. So we, you will get an alert before you upload that picture. Then we also have some, uh, then we also have an example here from Magenta. So that's in the world of music. So Magenta Studio is used for music production. So what Magenta is doing is they are actually using TensorFlow.js in order to use machine learning models in order to generate music. 
Star, before I, I go to my references, I can also check here if there are some more questions here. Uh, no, no more questions here. So, um, yeah, so I hope you found this uh, presentation here inspiring. And um, I also have some references. So we have references to the uh, to the official TensorFlow um, documentation. And you can also study a course on Coursera, which calls Introduction to TensorFlow. And if you want to know more about this image classifier, there is a deeply said uh, video tutorial. Or you can also Google has also a lot of different types of code labs that you can learn from. But I see that we have some more minutes left here. So then I will take the chance here to talk a little bit about this AI 42 online AI school. So the idea here with the AI 42 is that we want to be able to provide anyone who has internet connection to, um, to be able to learn about machine learning and data science. And the way that we do this is we are streaming every second Wednesday where we connect an indus industry expert or recognized speaker that talks about the topic that he, is very, he or she is very knowledgeable on. So we started out with mathematics, with the statistics, with the probability theory. And then after that, we've gone into programming with R, programming with Python, uh, deep learning, but also on tools like how can you use Databricks or Power BI and, and so on. So we believe that this set of, um, set of sessions will take you all the way from a complete beginner so that you will be able to build your own model. If this sounds interesting to you, you can find more information both on our Instagram page, on our Twitter account, on Facebook, and you can also watch all of our previous sessions here on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. You can reach it by scanning this QR code. Or if you're interested in finding out when will, when will the next session be, you can also scan this QR code to get to our Meetup page. So with that said, I would like to thank all of you that has watched this uh, session. And if you want to reach me, you can always find me on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter name, my Twitter handle is, is Agrevlis. Or you can find me, you can send me an email here on this email address, which is shown here on this slide. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was inspiring and interesting session. I learned a lot. Uh, hopefully all of you enjoyed uh, and learned something new. Uh, thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, thank you for co-founding such uh, great uh, initiatives the meetups, the AI42. And if you have any other question, feel free to write in the chat. We still have two minutes. If not, I want to thank you very much for joining Dev Days. Hope you enjoyed the web and mobile track and have a wonderful evening. There is another question. Um, do you have some exam XM application, sorry, of application of TensorFlow in Python. Yes, yeah, so there is, you know, Python is the most well-known um, environment for TensorFlow. So there are lo loads of different applications of that. So I think you can just Google. But the thing is here that, you know, if you want to use Python, then you both need to learn Python, which is a new language. You need to learn about Jupyter Notebooks and Conda and a lot of different things. So the thing here with the TensorFlow JS is that that abstracts all of that thing away. So you just need to know, learn about JavaScript, which hopefully as a web developer, probably you already know some JavaScript. So that's this makes it much more accessible, machine learning much more accessible to all the web developers uh, around the world. Thank you. Any other question? Thank you very much. Thank you so much.